Hey guys, I'm here with Jonathan, the Lawn Care Millionaire. If you don't know who that is, I'll put the link in the description. Go ahead and check out his channel. Um, for those of you that do know, hey, there he is. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> so I want to, uh, I've been wanting to ask Jonathan a few more questions based off of conversations that we've had off camera over the past year, I'd say. I mean, saw him at the GIE Plus Expo. It's a great place where we all meet up and hang out. But some major things that we've all been affected uh, with is is labor issues, right? I mean, that's kind of one of those things that always happens for for any kind of service business, but especially for the lawn lawn and landscaping, the green industry as a whole right now specifically because the economy is doing so well, unemployment rates so low. That's a good thing, but it may, means it's harder to find good people and you have to pay them a lot more, and which which is fine if you find a good person, pay them. But there's just a lot of different things involved with that a lot of challenges and I've heard of companies that have gone out of business uh, recently because they just don't want to play this game that game anymore yeah. they just don't have enough labor to, to keep everything afloat they have so much work and they don't have enough people to do it or they're downsizing I know people that are downsizing going back to solo or one crew or whatever it is and it's all because of labor I even asked uh, someone recently would you have downsized if your employee issues were fine like if you had great employees and everything was fine would you have kept going and they were like absolutely yeah. so it, labor is a huge thing and myself included I mean I have a couple of good part-time employees right now but that doesn't mean that's gonna be like that forever you have to my thing is to always be hiring always be on the lookout treat my people well keep growing always make room for, for, for good people those are just some philosophies that I have but it, it, you know it hasn't been perfect by any means it's been a, a rough uh, first start to the to this season um, 2019 was a really huge transition trying to find people and growing pains and huge adjustment uh, settled down a little bit now we're kind of ready for 2020 but it's I don't want to take my eye off the ball yep. and just be complacent like all right I got a couple good guys I'm fine like I still want to always keep looking so I say all that just kind of set up this whole conversation uh, with you Jonathan about your experiences back you know city turf and and, and all of the experiences with everyone in service autopilot and academy and all of the members i'm sure you've heard a ton of stories and experiences from them too right yep. so i just wanted to kind of pick your brain and have you share it with everybody uh some some words of wisdom and, and experiences that you've had um starting with i remember one of the main things that seemed like that changed your lawn care business was a particular employee that you found uh somehow some way and yep. changed the game for you if you wanted to kind of yeah. elaborate on that yeah, so this is this is rewinding way back to the early days of City Turf, and there was this one. In, I guess let me set up the story. And we had at the time maybe twelve or thirteen people on the team, and I used to be a partner in this cleaning company. And one day I was out back at that cleaning company. It was just kind of an office building with some warehousing in the back, and I was standing outside for whatever reason. My truck was out there, and I was out back behind the building, and there was this guy walking down the street. And he, he actually walked up to me at the back of the building. You, from where we were at, you could sort of see the sidewalk. And he was asking if we had any work. And I'm like, well, what, what do you do? And he said, oh, I paint homes or paint businesses. And I was like, well, no, I'm a, we're a cleaning company. And then we also, I also have this lawn care company. He's like, oh, well, I've, I was in the, I've been in lawn care for, I think it was like 10 or 12 years. The guy's name was Elder. And he was from Guatemala. And he had been working in the U.S. 10 or 12 years and so I said yeah actually I'm looking for someone and I literally said can you work this if I remember correctly it's like can you work this Saturday <laughs> and so um, Elder hopped on a crew and again I had let's call it 12 team members at the time and I had a few team members that I really liked and others that you know I felt like we were doing an okay job and I don't remember the exact numbers now but it was something as like we were doing 20 or 25 jobs a day residential. So we were mowing some, we had commercial and we had residential. I ended up using Elder on both. But the the thing that was sort of eye-opening to me is I put him on this one crew with actually one of my favorite people on our team, his name was Mark. And, uh, and Mark and Elder and another guy worked on that crew in the coming weeks and they were doing, a, at the beginning of the week we would do commercial and at the end of the week we'd do residential. And we went from doing 20, 25 jobs a day to 30 something jobs a day. Nothing changed except we put Elder on the crew, nothing. And then at our commercial jobs, everything went faster. Everything was faster in general and, and our teams worked longer. So they worked more hours per day. 
and they also got more done. Not just because they were working more hours, but because they were moving much more quickly. And that was sort of a huh kind of moment. Like, wait a second, this is interesting. I've, I've been at this business now a couple years and this is now a dramatic change. And that was the realization that, um, the beginning of the realization that, oh, okay, there's, there's good workers and then there's people that really know what they're doing. And up until that point, I had never found people that really know what they're doing. They definitely knew the skill. They got out there and they did the work. They were nice guys. But Elder quickly got frustrated with the team and I told him, just go find some guys. Just go get some guys that you like. And so he recruited this guy named Andres, and uh, who was also from Guatemala. And Andres was now on the truck with Elder and then one other individual. And it just was crazy. It was life changing. And so what I ended up doing is eventually letting Elder help me recruit other people. And, if, and then I also made a change that if Elder didn't feel that that person was working out, I would get rid of them for Elder. Then that spread to getting another crew leader that was good, and then I'd let that crew leader kind of figure out who they wanted on the team. And, it, and ultimately what ended up happening is I let almost every other team member that we previously had go and rebuilt my entire team. Around Elder. Around, yeah, what I had Around, learned like, from Elder. Yeah, and characters. Elder helping me find additional people. And then eventually we started using the H2B visa labor market as well. Okay. And we just started, so that was yet another, like, oh my, these are, this is another, if you go recruit the right individuals, is another level of talent. Now yeah. there's challenges with all of that. None of it is a, you know, none of it solves all the problems. Right. But it was so dramatic, it's like, oh, wait a second, I could actually build a good business here. Previously, I just, I hated the business. I hated everything about it. I didn't even know why I was in the business. And that was not the only thing we've talked about before. Right. The labor was just one piece. Right. But I started figuring out who the right clients were, what the, the right everything, the right way to market, the right all these things. And all of that combined is what sort of woke me up and said, wait a second, I think I can build something really interesting here. It's worth the time and money. Yeah. But, and I think ultimately, even if you did everything else right, and get all this work lined up, you'd still be banging your head on the wall, not oh. being able to get it all done because you didn't have the right people. That's the core uh, of everything. You're right. yeah. yeah. So it's like that was like the missing piece, yeah. if if that was even the timing of it. But I'm just saying like that. It was that the missing. Been, yeah. It was the thing because I was sort of at a place where I had the, was partner in the cleaning company. I was doing my tech consulting. I used to do a lot of pro, contract programming. Uh, I had enough stuff going that I was making a, a living on those other things. I didn't need this lawn care thing at all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, once I, the labor thing was sort of that wake, wake up moment where I was like, wait a second, this could actually be a good business. Mm -hmm. Previous to that, I just wanted out. Yeah. I was like, why in the world was I in it? So I would say that was probably one of the most important catalysts. The other one, I won't go into the story, was a, a partner of mine in the cleaning company saying, well, if you don't like the business or don't like the way it is, you don't have to do it. And that resulted in a reinvention of the business where I just got rid of the clients and the equipment, the team mm -hmm. members that yeah. I didn't like and just did the part I liked. And that's, that was the other big moment. It's like aha moments. Like, okay, wait, if you built the business the way you want to build the business and not the way everybody else builds a business in the mm -hmm. green industry, this could actually be really profitable and this could be really interesting. And what, what were some of the things, like what was it that you changed that you liked? Like you said, you, you focused on doing what you, what you actually like and got rid of the stuff. You, we talk about employees. What was some other key things. So you're talking about like niching your business into certain that services? Was one, yeah, that would be one. So initially when we started, I had experience in commercial. So I started out as commercial. And while I was doing the commercial, just because I, I really was studying marketing, I started really thinking more and more about who is the best client, who is the, who's not, who's the one, who's the most profitable book client, but two, who is the best client to work with? The commercial game where they just beat you down every year and you have to renegotiate contracts is a fine, I still like commercial. I'm not negative on commercial, but I just thought, you know, to have to go out to bid every year and to have to get, and then they get multiple bids to double check the price, that's, contrast that to a homeowner who will probably price shop you on the first job, but isn't going to price shop you for all the add-on things that they're going to buy from you doesn't mean you gouge them or rip them off or anything of that sort, but you can actually price things in a way that you can deliver a high level of quality service and afford the best team members and afford to deliver a great product. Those things were very interesting to me. And I just thought, I think there might be more profit in that market than commercial. And so that was sort of a light bulb moment 
And what was going on is I was doing big commercial. Uh, mean, big to me is you're at one property all day. I was doing small commercial. You know, might pay thirty five hundred to five thousand bucks a year. I was doing small residential. I was doing three acre residential. I was driving from one side of town all the way to the other side of the Dallas market, which is a massive market. And those things all sucked. Combine that with, um, you know, we were doing all services. So now I've got to have equipment for all the different services. Some of those services don't actually make you very much money because you're only doing $10,000 a year of variation, as an example. There's no money in $10,000 a year variation. It's just a distraction. And so the example of doing what I want was saying, who is the very best client in the market who we most like working with, who will buy more from us, who can afford to pay, that we can build a lot of density and so asking a lot of questions of what would be the ideal business? What services should we not be in? What are the best services to be in? And crafting a business around those questions. That's what we did. Mm. And, and it was a game changer. And you probably had a lot of people along that process that like, I think the hardest thing for people is to, to tell people no, to tell people, you know, like, oh, we don't offer this service right now. Or, and then they're like, okay, well, who do you recommend? And yeah. there's a lot of back and forth with that. And you feel like you're losing out on business and you know, all that kind of stuff. But clearly it was successful for, for you. Yeah. I mean, but what is, do you have any other tips for how you navigated that? I'm sure you've had, had that a lot. It right? was, yeah, you know, it was. You to do stuff that you didn't do. And you're yeah. like, no, no, we don't do that. So I, and I'm definitely wired to be someone that I I'm, I would describe myself as a very loyal person, and I'm definitely wired to help people. I empathize. This is the kind of company we've tried to build here at Service Alpha. I look for people that have empathy, that care about our members. I'm just wired that way. So I don't like if you've got a problem, I want to help you solve it. If I've got a client that's sort of in a jam, and I want to help them, I just that's how I am. The thing I've learned: if I got a team member that's struggling, I want to help the team member. The thing I've come to conclude is you can do that to a point. You can do all those things to a point, but there's also a point where you have to say what's right for the organization because when you're not making the right decision for the organization, I'll give a couple examples, but when you're not making the right decision for the organization, you're hurting you, you're hurting your family. Usually our families get sacrificed in this stuff. It's like if you make one more promise to a client that means you don't get home till eight o'clock tonight, who just got screwed in that deal? Right. Your wife, Family, your kids, yeah. that's who got screwed. I've done that a million times. Still do it. You know, we still we still yeah. overpromise, we do stuff, do it all the time. But who's getting hurt here? Some some person, a client that maybe is a one time client that has zero loyalty essentially to your company, that you've now rearranged your whole schedule that's messing with everybody else so that you'll probably make a few dollars in profit. It's like why? And so sometimes you just have to sort of say, this is not right for the organization. The other group that gets screwed by poor decision making or saying yes to too many things is your team. They get screwed over when you let the wrong people stay on the team. They get screwed over when you hire the wrong team members and you're unwilling to have the difficult conversation, get them off the team. When you take one time work, that means they don't get home till eight o'clock at night. When you take one time work, I'm just using one time as an example, yeah. one time work and you rearrange the whole schedule for somebody that's gonna work with you one time and they get hurt as well as your loyal customers get hurt who get delayed and postponed. And one time's just one example here. And so what I've concluded over time is that the companies that do best are the companies that put rules in place and say, we don't go to these markets, we don't offer these services, we don't hire these types of employees. If these types of employees are a challenge, we move them off the team. Those, it, almost all of the good stuff that happens in the business all comes from hard conversations and hard decisions, which are exactly what almost all of us, including me, want to avoid, because it sucks. So I'll go back to my story. So for me to take what ended up happening in that business is we went from about 400,000 a year down to about, I think it was 205 or 225, I don't remember my numbers. So to cut that much work, let's call it $175,000 in work, to cut that in a matter of weeks, meant that I had to call some really great customers and say, hey, we won't be coming back. We'll be taking care of the property until you find a new company. Or to call some great commercial clients and say, we're going to finish out the contract, but this will be it. And, and, and it, to let all the team members go except four, Elder was one that I kept, Arturo. I don't know, did I say Andres earlier? It was actually Arturo. I might have said Andres earlier. It was Arturo that was the guy with the Elder. I kept Elder. Um, Arturo, and then I can't remember the other two individuals. I had to let everybody else go. Like those are hard decisions. Those are things that you stress about and you don't want to do. And I will I'll say, I'll repeat what I said earlier. And, and I, I tell you to ask this of yourself. 
When you know that you need to let somebody go, when you know that you need to fire a client, when you know that you need to change something and you're stressed about it, you're worried about in the morning, you're worried about when you go to sleep, how often do you procrastinate the decision? I procrastinated those decisions. All of the good stuff that happens in a business comes from making those decisions. They're momentary, painful decisions that suck. They're the worst part of running and building a company, but once they're done, they usually last for about 24 hours of pain. Once they're done, everything else thereafter is better. And that's, that's what building a business is. It's making those hard decisions, having the hard conversations, but they result in all the positive change. And that's the experience I went through. And I continue, I mean, building companies, yeah. that continues to happen. So um, maybe I diverted a little bit from your question, but it was, it was a series of hard questions, conversations, right. and long-term hard discussions. You've got a, a client, a prospect that calls and says, hey, why can't you just come another half mile? My friend Mary, who loves you, referred to you. And oh, by the way, if you come another half mile, I'll get you like 10 of my neighbors. Like yeah. you know all those stories. Yeah. That's hard. Or we only work with clients that pay us by credit card. One of the most important things we ever changed in a business did in 2007. And, you know, it's a million people that are just super nice people are like, well, I'm retired or, I, you know, whatever the story is, can, I, can you make an exception? Exceptions kill companies. I mean, you do want to work with the client. You want to help the client. You want to go out of your way. You want to do all that. But there's certain things you learn over time are the things that sort of destroy a company. They eat away at a company in the long term. And it's all a series of hard decisions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I had to let go a whole route um, going into 2020 because I took it on because it was, you know, get this right. It was so the first customer in, in that I was already the client that I was servicing in my main service area, his mom was a little bit further away. So yep. I took on the mom and then the mom and then the other son, the, the brother, yep. Yep. <laughs> the other son is even further away than that. Yep. So when you come down to it, I'm going from, you know, one brother to the other brother, it's like, you know, 15 minutes away and, and you think, oh, what's the big deal? But when you're talking about lawn maintenance, that's a big deal of unnecessary 30 minute round trip to go out there. And it was, there was four, you know, oh, and there's a the whole thing, right? Oh, there's, there's, you know, it's at the bus stop. We can get you, I can get you three more people, all four of us. Come on, it's only, you know, it's only like, you know, five minutes from my mom's house, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you're already coming out there, but then, you know, you just, so I went along with it, but then when you do that every single week, you realize how bad this is, especially when the route gets broken especially when it gets broken because of all the weather yep. or breakdowns or call outs, all the stuff that we all experience. And now all of a sudden you have to go a different day out to those four. Yep. And now you're driving 30 minutes to get out there or to get to the next route. Literally, yep. I would have to drive there multiple times. I had to go from that neighborhood 30 minutes to another neighborhood on the highway and everything. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yep. Because it's not always a, it's not a perfect world. So you, you build this route out, but if that route is like all spread out, what about these people out here? What if you can't finish that route? Now you have to add them to a totally different day where you're in another section over here somewhere. So obviously it's all about route density, right? And you get you can't get that you can't let the creep. You right. know, you can't let right. that creep it's dangerous. because that's where you end up losing money. So I and that to, happens in every part of the business. Routing is just one example, but it happens in letting uh, like sacrificing on one more team member you let on the team, sacrificing on one more, you know, whatever that you're like, oh, okay, well, we have to, we'll let that slip this time. It's like, you right. can just imagine all the scenarios and yeah. one day you wake up, it's no wonder that most individuals in the industry hate the industry or burn down the industry or tired. Some get out of the business. No wonder that happens because these businesses slowly degrade over time. Or maybe they were never, maybe they never got to a great place because right. they were never, uh, they were never built in any specific way. So, uh, rounding back to um, to to labor. Yeah. What what are some things you you'd also had mentioned to me off camera before uh, when I was just kind of rattling off stuff and saying something about you know having to rehire people or always you know hiring people and you're like it doesn't have to be that way mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to dig into that a little bit like what 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 did you mean by that and what are some tips that you have for that like so that you can hire good people, retain good people so that you don't have to go through this attrition constantly. Yeah. Yeah. So